Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Buckler, and I'm from University of California, Irvine. I'm going to be talking to you today about our IT consolidation efforts that have been going on the last couple of years. And in the interest of time, and to give you all more time to ask questions, which I think is a really useful part, I'm going to just give you an overview. Um, as you could imagine, if any of you have been involved in even thinking about IT consolidation, uh, we could talk all day about this topic. So I'll try to keep it high level so we can keep moving along. I want to give you a little bit of context for our collaboration efforts. Uh, the primary drivers that we actually had, um, go figure, the budget crisis, and also a commitment to improving efficiency. In early 2009, in response to the budget crisis, there was this Big Ideas work group, and they were tasked with identifying ways to cut costs, improve efficiencies, and such. And they recommended consolidating administrative IT so um, our provost, Godfordson, created the central IT organization called Office of IT. We call it OIT. And that's led by my boss, CIO Dana Rood. I would say that one of our success factors is that we had top-down support from the provost. I think that was critical to our success. He provided a clear direction and directive for the consolidation, despite some pushback, you could imagine, on campus. He provided his full commitment and support for all of our efforts. His support was important uh, as we faced resistance and also uh, really helped us move forward. I wanted to point out, um, there's a lot of good information and details about our consolidation on our website. And on the last slide, um, there's some URLs um, that I think will be useful to you. I would encourage you to download um, our presentation because um, although the uh, bullets on my slides are pretty sparse, um, I have fairly detailed no speaker's notes that I think will be useful to you as a reference. Also, there is a more detailed presentation um, that's linked on the last page that we gave to Davis recently when they came down to visit us, and I think that'll be helpful to you. The scope of the organizational consolidation was primarily focused on administrative IT. The administrative units consolidated so far include Administrative Computing Services, or ADCOM, Network and Academic Computing Services, NACS, and about 15 smaller IT units. I was going to read them off, but I'll spare you those details right now. Uh, we formed a new senior leadership team by combining the directors from the former ADCOM and NACS, reporting to the CIO, Dana Rood. And the directors kept most areas of responsibility. Um, we really kind of had to keep our old jobs and take on new jobs. So we, we had our old areas of responsibilities and we also got some new areas. Uh, for example, I was managing uh, mostly network and telecommunications operations and I took on desktop support and Windows services. The consolidation did not include the academics. Um, instead, the focus for academic IT was to increase collaboration with OIT, which we already had pretty good collaboration going on with the academic units with NACs, but we wanted to look for more opportunities for sharing services and leveraging central commodity IT services. I wanted to point out also um, the URL to our current org chart is on the last slide. The goals for consolidation include fully leveraging IT as a strategic resource in achieving campus goals, Reduce duplication of effort, which you could imagine with all the distributed IT, a lot of duplication. Improve efficiency of delivering services. And hopefully reducing future costs and ensuring maximum return on IT investment. Um, we wanted to guide strategic investments in IT through a campus-wide view of needs and make them in the context of an integrated technology environment. Uh, in the short term, believe it or not, cost cutting was not an expected outcome of the consolidation. It was not even a primary driver. It would obviously be nice to, to have short-term cost savings from consolidation, but we, we really realized early on it was more about efficiency and effectiveness of delivering services, collaboration, things like that, not so much about immediate cost savings. You would really have to, as some other groups mentioned, um, reduce staff in order to be able to uh, reduce costs in a significant way. 
However, we have sort of coincidentally seen an annual cost savings of a couple million dollars through staff attrition, which wasn't part of the consolidation, just people leaving and layoffs, or not layoffs, retirements, for example, and just not filling those positions. And I would say the consolidation helped us with that because it gave us a larger pool of IT staff to be able to reach out to to help um, with some of these unfilled vacancies. Benefits of consolidation. Uh, by centralizing commodity services, such as our help desk, desktop support, and also system administration, it allowed our software developers who uh, often were wearing many hats, desktop support, help desk, programming, system administration, you know the drill. Um, they were able to actually focus on software development. Um, we also were able to increase collaboration and sharing of informa information, expertise, tools, processes, facilities, and best practices. We had greater opportunities for sharing limited resources, including staff, student employees, budgets, project resources. We increased our ability to handle the loss of key position by permanently or temporarily backfilling that position with existing consolidated staff. We also increased standardization of hardware and software, and that helped us improve efficiencies and also our desktop support ratios. There's many opportunities for consolidation of redundant and older infrastructure into common facilities with server virtualization. Uh, for example, let's see how to scroll this down. Thank you. Uh, we had one example where we were able to consolidate and virtualize uh, 109 servers that were serving uh, eight different departments. We virtualized that down into just two clusters occupying half of an equipment rack. And that actually freed up two small server rooms so because we consolidated that infrastructure into another server room. That's just one example of um, some of the um, reduction of duplication and consolidation of infrastructure. Also, the staff perspective, I think, has improved. Um, it's become more collaborative and global, bigger picture type of thinking. So instead of this is sort of my problem in my bubble, it's now our problem to solve together in a larger context. And we also developed cross-functional teams that helped a lot. Um, more context, by centralizing, uh, let's see here, now I gotta scroll back up. This trackpad, sorry. That's okay. Just, there you go. You're right on it. Now move it up. With two hands, two fingers. There. there you go. Sorry, this Mac has a different trackpad than mine. I'm not used to it. Uh, benefits of consolidation by centralizing commodity services such as our help desk and desktop support. Did I cover this already? No. I'm going to use the old-fashioned way. It's going to be easier for me. <laughs> so by uh, centralizing commodity services, such as our help desk and desktop support, and also system administration, I think I did cover this. Sorry. OK, next slide. Design model. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties there. Um, so we currently, just to give you some numbers, we currently have about 250 staff from 18 different units uh, with affiliate reporting relationships in seven different units. Um, this consisted of ADCOM, about 58 employees, NACs, 90, other units, about 80, and new positions, we added about 20. Uh, the scope of our help desk, we merged uh, help desks from the former ADCOM and NACS. The former ADCOM uh, had four career staff, and they supported administrative systems and also provided desktop support. They supported about 3,000, uh, mostly staff. And the coverage was 24-5, was with weekend on-call support available as needed. Uh, the former NACS side, um, 
help desk team had five career staff plus students, and they supported network and telecom services, email, academic computing services as well. They supported a lot of customers, faculty, staff, and students, uh, roughly 30,000 people. Um, coverage was 24-7 with after-hour support. Um, the scope of desktop support, we merged desktop support from nine different departments. We hired two new FTE and several students. And we now have 13 uh, desktop techs and two managers supporting about 1,500 clients. Um, we're supporting mostly HP uh, hardware and some Macs and mini mobile devices. Um, continuing on the design model, uh, what services were included? Really, we included all the services um, with a focus, though, on commodity services uh, like help desk and desktop support and uh, Windows services. Um, we did it, uh, take on, I guess, some new services or at least some new expectations because each of the units that had their own IT, you could imagine, had their own business functions and their own um, niche needs, so we had to take that on. Um, what services were excluded? Really nothing. Uh, the implementation, how long did it take? We began our org consolidation in July 2009, and we implemented across four phases. Uh, we focused, though, primarily uh, the initial consolidation was more about reporting relationships and org changes than it was about operational changes and technical changes. Our initial org consolidation was completed in September 2010, and the integration of further org changes are ongoing. I wanted to kind of give you a definition of what I mean by integration versus consolidation. In our environment, we called consolidation more the organizational changes that occur with, with an IT consolidation, and integration refers more to the implementation and operational details. So this is the ongoing part, you know, devil's in the details. What do we have to do to actually integrate our organizations in terms of processes, tools, cross-training, merging cultures, standardizing environments, and consolidating infrastructure? That's what I'm calling integration. So we, can, we quickly consolidated um, at the org chart level, but then this integration process has been ongoing. Uh, implementation resources, uh, we had still significant time and effort required by our senior and middle level managers in planning and integrating. Um, also, we had to ask, add additional desktop staff and a few other staff in order to address priority needs. The costs, uh, unlike some of the other slides that were, were put up here, because we focused mainly on um, the organizational side of consolidation first and didn't make a lot of changes to systems, um, we also didn't implement service now. Um, we didn't have a lot of costs associated with the, uh, the consolidation. It was mainly costs in our staff time. Uh, we did have some investment in consulting services. We also spent some money on land desk, um, for remote support and Namara footprints as our incident management system. Uh, challenges and also some fixes. Uh, one challenge, that I guess it was our main challenge and our main goal was uh, making sure we could keep operations running smoothly while still making progress on projects and moving forward with the integration. Um, in order to do that, we made changes incrementally over time we changed only what had to be changed in order to uh, have helpful integration. So we weren't consolidating and integrating just for the sake of saying we did. We really wanted to do it where it made sense and where we had low hanging fruit and where we could do things that made sense early on. We really couldn't afford to do a lot of uh, planning and preparation because we had this directive to make this consolidation happen very quickly. So we couldn't afford to start from scratch and come up with that ideal organization. We really just needed to dive in. It does continue to be a significant challenge to make time to plan and implement consolidation and also to integrate. But we made it a top priority for everybody. Uh, we shifted and delegated some responsibilities and we also promoted some staff into some leadership positions that helped move things forward. Um, the OIT management team, uh, including myself, had kind of limited experience in doing this type of large organizational change. 
And so we hired a consultant to help us with the initial planning. We also consulted with other campuses who had uh, started down this road, such as UC Santa Cruz. Um, we had a strong commitment to success, and I think most of all, we were willing to try things out, knowing that we might not get it right the first time, and then make adjustments. Um, some more challenges and fixes. Um, integrating teams and cultures and tools and processes and also standards continues to be an ongoing challenge for us, as you can imagine. Some of the ways we address this, we right away co-located our help desk and desktop support teams into the same building, and as soon as possible, we started cross-training and blending our teams. Uh, we thoroughly documented the issues most frequently coming in, and then we started to cross-train the staff on all these different issues and create internal documentation that we could use as a knowledge base. We paired up our desktop support staff from different consolidated units, and then we held them accountable for cross-training each other and working on tickets and projects together. We developed selective specialization in the help desk. So instead of trying to make everybody in help desk an expert day one on all these new areas that we were facing to support, we made sure that everyone in help desk had the skills that they needed to do initial uh, assessment of what was necessary and to be able to dispatch those calls effectively out to second and third level support. We did also develop um, areas of expertise within the help desk to where we could escalate different types of issues to those individuals. Uh, some more challenges and fixes with the implementation. Um, in terms of integrating teams, cultures, tools, processes, and standards, what we also did was we consolidated two different well-known help desk phone numbers from the former NACS and ADCOM. And we, um, we had those basically route uh, together into the same help desk. We also set up a phone tree, and we tried to limit the amount of choices that people had on that to just uh, two or three choices. Uh, we migrated to common tools in help desk and desktop. We looked at the different uh, issue tracking tools that were used in AdCom and NACS, and we decided to implement Numara footprints. We then reworked our problem categories um, so that we could easily categorize the different types of issues that were coming in and dispatch those out. And we also expanded the use of Landesk uh, for support, uh, for desktop support and also server administration. We reviewed processes for improvement and worked to integrate the different processes uh, used out in the consolidated units and we combined best practices. Also because each consolidated unit had a different IT environment with different standards, uh, we've really been trying to focus on standardization of hardware and software. Uh, on the service delivery front, um, some clients, uh, as you can imagine, had different expectations about service delivery than others. Uh, a term that I, I think I coined is uh, some of them were sort of spoiled with what I call tap on the shoulder IT support. You know, hey Sam, can you help me with this now? Yeah, no problem, right now. It's a little difficult to compete with that with a central help desk, um, but I think we've done all right. Um, what we did is we negotiated new SLAs with each of our customer groups, making sure we understood how they were currently supported and trying to help them navigate through the new central process. We tried to adjust expectations where we could and where we weren't able to do that, we negotiated SLAs. We also reviewed service requests and we uh, made sure that our VIPs knew how to escalate issues within our um, organization. We also identified uh, what we call departmental liaisons. We actually borrowed that term from Santa Cruz. And um, those folks have responsibilities for sort of bridging that gap between the local units and central IT. Um, also, um, help desk and desktop struggle to support specialized needs. Uh, any of you who are in a desktop support role know how difficult it is to support non-standard environments and to make sure your people have the right tools and the right knowledge in place to be able to efficiently support things. And so if everything's cookie cutter, it's real easy, right? And when you have all this new stuff to support that's not standard, it's really difficult. So we're still struggling with that. The way we're handling that is developing SLAs and standards, identifying subject matter experts, 
and partnering with our departmental liaisons. Uh, more on service delivery. Uh, desktop support had a tough time managing their heavy workload. Uh, really, they still do, but it's getting a little better. They had a hard time balancing um, their staff resources between uh, break fix, system administration duties, uh, implementing new technologies, keeping up with projects, like new rollouts of hardware and such, and then at the same time on top of all that, trying to make progress on the integration activities of the consolidation. So what we did to help there is we added an assistant manager who could handle really the day-to-day -day operations and, and supervising the staff on the front lines. Um, then we, that enabled our desktop support manager to focus more on the planning, project management, uh, overall resource allocation, and also communication with stakeholders. We reviewed and improved our operational processes and worked a lot on trying to figure out how to streamline things and improve the efficiency of our, our process. We also looked at workload sharing um, by encouraging teamwork and internal communication and making sure everybody was um, doing their fair share. We also partner with our Windows Server group, our infrastructure group, to share some workload and move some appropriate responsibilities to that group, such as server patching. Lessons learned. We're getting down to the final uh, slides here. Um, on planning, um, honestly, I think we could have benefited from more planning on the front end. So if you have the luxury of doing the planning, do it. On the other hand, um, those of you who've worked in this environment know that we can get mirrored down in planning and get into analysis paralysis and sometimes never get anywhere with things if we plan too much. So one of the advantages is we were just forced to dive in, you know, without the life vest and just figure out how to swim. And I think there were some advantages to that. It was painful in a way to do it that way, but I think we made great progress. Um, consultation, I think, is key. Um, I think if you can afford a good consultant, especially one that has done this in corporate sectors or public sectors and has done large organizational change, I think that could be very helpful to you. Um, also, staff resources. In looking back, I really think, you know, we just tried to accomplish this with the people we had. And I think that if we would have hired maybe some temporary staff in both help desk and desktop support um, to help us get over that initial hurdle of documenting things, cross-training, creating user documentation, creating standards, developing SLAs, and communicating all this out to our stakeholders, including doing outreach and circling that feedback around. I think that could have helped us. We tried to do that with our operations people and with the managers who already had full plates, and it was pretty difficult. Um, in terms of communication, you can never really do enough of that. And I would say um, develop your communication plans and strategies early on and um, really tackle that early on. One, some of the things we did there, we have a bi-monthly newsletter that keeps the campus aware of what we're doing. We have monthly internal leadership updates, and we also have a quarterly update that's focused just to our desktop um, customers. We also um, have done a lot on the customer feedback. Um, we started off with the big surveys, and then we realized it's just so time consuming to get surveys out, analyze that data, and then feel like you actually have a meaningful response back to your, um, your survey base. So what we decided to do instead is we're basically taking a sampling of the tickets that come in, and on a weekly basis, we're actually calling people back and saying, hey, how did things go, and how can we do better? And we feel that that's been a better way to address um, that feedback loop. A few more lessons learned, and then We'll get the Q&A. On our phone tree, um, I would suggest if you do implement a phone tree uh, for your help desk, be careful about how you transition your help desks together and the customer experience there. So um, if you're going to consolidate help desk numbers, I would say don't eliminate help desk numbers. Just have, um, if you're going to try to come up with one help desk number you're going to standardize on, have the other help desk numbers forward to that. And I would suggest, uh, at least for quite some time, don't eliminate those other numbers. Just have them the route into that. Um, also, keep your phone tree options limited and, and concise. Uh, if any of you have done 
uh, phone trees on the front end of support. Our tendency, I think, is, you know what, if we give them all the really good information and options, they'll leave us alone and go away. Um, I don't think that really works. So um, you don't want to put them in voicemail jail, and you don't want to uh, have them slog through too many trees. So I think it's best, really, uh, to just limit the, the options and route them as quickly as you can to where they need to go. Um, also, um, we did standardize on Numera footprints. I think it's been good. So far, we've been happy with it. Um, we may at some point go to ServiceNow or another model, but that tool is working good for us. If you do, um, most of these um, issue tracking systems allow you to do auto assignment, and that's something that really did help us. It just takes some design. So in other words, we were able to identify which categories of requests should go to which technical support uh, individuals or groups. And we were able to um, uh, categorize those in a way that we could auto-assign tickets. And I think that helped us with our help desk efficiency. Um, let's see here. Um, the last point is uh, we keep an eye on our ticket stats, especially open tickets, to make sure that we don't have anything slipping through the cracks. And we make sure to push those stats out to the different managers um, who are in, responsible for su supporting or responding to that. And on the last slide, um, we have these URLs that I was talking about. And I'll thank you for your time and open it up to questions. Well, thank you all for your, pr your presentations. That was great. So we have about 10 minutes or so. Um, let's just open it up to you all to ask any questions. And if you don't have any, I have a whole list. So. Yes. Was this limited to the academic side of the line, or was this also included with the medical center? So the medical center, it was not included. The medical center is really their own uh, organization, uh, and we collaborate a lot with them. And it was focused, as I mentioned, on administrative IT at this point, with the academic IT separate. Tim? Uh, I'm going to let Lyle address that question. You want to repeat it? Yeah, the, the, the question was, since we've given up surveys and we're calling customers back, how many of the tickets we get in a month do we actually call back? And the fact of the matter is, we're probably only calling back about 1% of the tickets, but each contact has proved valuable. We've got, we, we chose a model leaning towards sustainability rather than exhaustiveness. And that's, that served us well, because over time, we build a larger and larger database of, of client feedback without, in any given week, exhausting ourselves. Do you have a question up front here? Did you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was, was one of our biggest challenges and I think still continues to be. Um, we have, like I said, 13 techs now and they came from different units. And um, cross-training was also a big challenge. But um, where we've tried, tried to find a good balance is the technicians weren't too excited about us over-specializing their jobs. Um, they actually appreciated being able to do system administration, doing a lot of different things, not just break fix. And so we've tried to keep their jobs rich in that way, but that can also be kind of inefficient when you have the same technician trying to do break fix and projects and system administration, yada, yada. So by bringing in that assistant manager who could work closely with sort of the overall manager and project manager, um, they were able to kind of keep track of what's happening on the break fix side keep track of what's in the project queue and negotiating those expectations and schedules, and then being able to um, communicate with each other almost on a daily basis about who's free, who's working on this right now. OK, this guy's been working on tickets a lot. How about we move him over to projects for a while? It's really been kind of a juggling act. But that was very difficult to do when we just had one manager trying to address all of that. Now that we have somebody who's focused really on that frontline support, um, that person is also the supervisor, 
now of the frontline techs, and then the other uh, managers focused more on the resources and project management. Parish and Chuck, did you have something to add to that? Not on the desktop. No, yeah, 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 we don't. Okay. So, quickly, as a follow on, you talked about 13 techs. Uh, how many end users or desktops or how many clients support? So, uh, yeah, I can repeat it. So, um, we're talking about desktop support ratios. So, we have um, 13 desktop techs supporting about 1,500. Uh, desktop customers. And that's really a, a small uh, number of the overall people who need desktop support on campus. Much larger um, subset of those uh, people are in the academic units and they're still supported by the local academic uh, technicians. Yes. Back here in the black. Let's start with uh, Parrish and Chuck, and then Julie, and then Brian. I would probably go to Chuck on the dispatch side of things, because I would see that as a, the residential networking part of things. Um, we didn't really do a lot of dispatching on the, the general help desk. I'd say uh, um, of all the, all the calls and emails that, that that end up at our help desk, we resolve probably 90% of them there, and then the remaining 10% need to be m moved somewhere else. Julie? Well, ours are, is this on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, ours are based on the different skill groups, so because the EPIC group is a new group, the APEX group, um, uh, and, and those calls are clinically oriented. We're only about 50% on re resolution. On the School of Medicine side, um, they're much closer to, closer to, I think, 80%. And on the generalist side, it ranges, um, depending on the types of calls, probably 50 to 70%. And then on the apps group, they do about 85%. Yeah, uh, I don't think we have first call closed quite to those levels, but like uh, Julie was saying, it depends a lot on what the nature of the question is. When people call in with a, I, my password isn't working, I need my password reset, those we can solve all of them. If they call in saying, there's a funny noise coming from my desktop, then we have to dispatch it to the desktop support people, and that is not a first call closed. We probably closed two thirds of the tickets on the first call, but we're dispatching to a lot of teams as well. And to add to that, both our desktop team and our help desk team use Landesk, and it has remote support capabilities, and so, a lot of times we are able to just get on the phone with a customer and get onto Landesk and kind of walk through and solve the problem remotely. I don't really know what the percentage of desktop tickets that come in where we have to roll a tech, but um, I'll guess 30% of them. I will add one quick note on there. As far as the HCT help desk and using footprints, um, as far as the escalation, we, on a monthly basis, probably escalate about 25% of the calls or emails that come in. So we're handling quite a few. Then a question here and then those two back there. Go ahead. So the question is, what are some of the areas you use to trigger auto-assign? Pretty much every category we've got, we have figured out in advance who the experts are, and every single ticket we create that isn't closed immediately is auto-assigned to either a team email address or all the members of a team. So we've just figured out a workflow for every kind of question that we can categorize and we auto assign it unless it's closed immediately. Um, Go ahead. 
Um, as far as auto assignment, at the help desk, we don't use it per se, uh, but we do have other groups that will use an auto assignment type thing in Footprints and actually a round robin that will kind of help spread the load out so that different programmers can work on different jobs. As far as the help desk, we do have a process which is an auto sign, but basically we will copy or move that ticket to a particular group once we know it's met those priorities or those specific needs. The gentleman in the light blue shirt. It's a great question. Uh, so, yeah, so the question is about desktop support ratios and 13 uh, desktop techs for 1,500 customers sounds like um, a ratio most of you would envy. And um, it doesn't feel uh, like we have too many staff. And I believe that if you go into desktop consolidation, you will find that as you're going through the growing pains of consolidating teams and processes and cross-training and trying to standardize the different environments, your efficiency level and your support ratio efficiency goes way down. And so really that's the main reason why I think it, our ratios don't look so great. Um, as we're beginning to consolidate or uh, standardize our support environments and get better cross-training, I think our ratios will go up. As I mentioned before, too, um, a lot of our desktop techs, when they're in the smaller units, they had the luxury of, well, I think they thought it was a luxury, of wearing many hats. So um, they, a lot of them still do system administration and project work and other types of activities besides break fix, and so it really does fill their time. Does that answer your question? Okay. Question in the back there. I lost track of all the questions. Yeah. So maybe we start with the help. So, let's, why don't we start with the help desk stats so, that you're looking for? Okay, let's do help desk. Average call length okay. and also the average call volume So I can answer the average call length. That's about nine minutes. Um, the average call per analyst I can't, I can't address because my staff is almost, almost entirely student staff uh, and none of them have regular hours, so it's, it's it's difficult to say. Um, and what was your what were what were your questions after that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I actually wanted to. I, I actually wanted to clarify that as well. Um, what I was saying is that 90% of the calls that come in are handled by our help desk staff, as opposed to being as, as, as opposed to being triaged out to other other units within our department. So um, that's not necessarily first call resolution, uh, and actually, it is definitely not first call resolution. Um, I would say first call resolution is probably um, more towards about 45%. Yeah. Julie, do you have stats on that? Yes. Um, so for the um, average um, talk time, 80% of our calls are five, the talk time is five minutes, but if you add the wrap up time, it could be, you know, up to seven, 80% um, of those. And then the, the other large majority is 16% um, are 20 minutes or more, um, and then you add a couple of minutes for, for wrap-up time. Uh, the next question was remote control. We use a lot of remote control, and we resolve a lot of the remote control, but I don't have a percentage of what percentage we resolve. And um, there was one other question I don't remember. Yeah, I, I don't have any of the... 
the call volume per analyst, um, we, uh, except for the School of Medicine, because those are the calls that take the long time, um, our analysts average, and I can only tell you per day, 35 to 50 per day per analyst. Uh, just to add a little bit to that, uh, we don't do remote in the case of the ACT help desk. Um, it takes us an average of 27 minutes per call. Um, once we escalate it, it takes up to three hours. So that then also brings us back to about 25% of those um, have to be escalated and can take anywhere from 12 to 48 hours to maybe even a week, depending on the, the complexity of them. Brian and Lyle, did If I had my preference, I would teach our CIOs never to use the word average. Hi. <laughs> because our curves are just highly skewed. We get a call that we know we can't handle, we create a ticket, we're on to the next call three minutes later. We get a call from somebody off campus and retired who's got to move from POP to IMAP, and it's three hours. <laughs> so take those two numbers, you get an average call length of 10 minutes, but what the heck does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. So we're trying to have actual uh, statistics and curves and balances and not ever focus on that really misleading word average and you know, it, it goes for you know call length and for the number of calls a particular staff member gets in a day I could throw out the number each of our people on the phone gets about 25 calls a day but the workload just jumps you know there will be days when we get you know 500 calls and days when we get 30 calls what meaning is there to an average so we actually try to give them tables and data and patterns and curves rather than single numbers because the single numbers don't do us any good there's a little bit of passion there yes. um i can see some some people milling out um out, out in the back to the get the presenters the next group ready uh, we can take one more question is there actually if brian didn't get a chance to answer the desktop question then we'll finish oh. um, just quickly to add on desktop um, we have, which if you go to our website, we have uh, published SLAs for not resolution, but response time, which I think are pretty aggressive, depending on the urgency expressed by the caller. Um, as far as resolution, I don't have metrics on that. Again, it's really all over the board because some things we resolve very quickly. And one of the things we're getting better at is trying to distinguish between tickets and projects. And sometimes those projects get lumped in with tickets and they really throw off that average as well. All right, well, I'd like to thank you presenters for your uh, time and consideration today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>